Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Uh, I decided to start my first video of on, on freedom of speech concept. Freedom? Off to a great start. Freedom of speech concepts today, mostly because I had, you know, a couple hours to sit down yesterday and collect my thoughts and make some notes and stuff like that. If you like this sort of video, financial support is greatly appreciated. Help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. I am sticking with Patreon um, despite all the other stuff that's been going on because it's still the best option for me. There is an email address in the description box of this video that you can use through PayPal to do a one-time donation. I am working on the PayPal ME direct link thing. I don't directly control that PayPal account. It's an FU network account administrated by somebody else. Um, uh, my personal PayPal account that I control has my personal email address on it. So I'm not real comfortable giving that out for obvious reasons. Um, so um, little did I know when I set that up all these years ago that it would be relevant like this. And it's really hard to get a second PayPal account. Um, so it's through the business and I don't handle it, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, that's not what this is about. What this is about is... I am doing a series of sort of impromptu videos. They're not fancy like lady bits or anything like that. They're just me talking with a few graphics, with a few text things. Um, I decided to do these videos in response to certain commenters that continue to periodically insist that I am against free speech because I disagree with certain speech. And that often baffles me because nothing about freedom of speech takes away my ability to disagree, even disagree vehemently with somebody else's opinions. In fact, free speech principles defend my right to disagree with someone among other protections. Disagreeing with someone does not mean they have the right to speak. It just means you think they're wrong. And I don't think these people that are making these ongoing criticisms are bad people. I think they have a radically different concept of what freedom of speech means than I do. And when I started thinking about it, I realized the whole concept of freedom of expression is actually a complex collection of concepts. Things like public participation, intellectual worthiness, quote unquote, the right to offend, the right to dissent, the right of self-determination, um, stuff like that. Free speech has always, always, always been limited. It is not, you know, used to support things like threats, defamation, immediate incitement to lawlessness, dissemination of private, personal, or classified information, speech integral to illegal conduct, or fraud. Uh, child pornography is something that even the most radical free speech advocates agree should not be protected. We have agreement on that one thing. More controversial are things like limits on um, obscenity, obscenity laws and regulation of commercial airwaves, which limit what can be done on broadcast TV, in all forms of advertising, and so on. Um, now, when people talk about free speech, the most commonly cited document is the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which I happen to have a fancy pants graphic right here. Here we go. I'm going to use my announcer voice. Here we go. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, people are like, why did you need to read the First Amendment? Well, because a lot of people actually don't realize that it is that simple. It's that short. That's it. Everything else connected to the First Amendment, including freedom from religion as well as freedom of religion, um, the sweeping blanket protections of speech, including things like lying and bigotry, all those nuances of the First Amendment have been decided by American courts. And those courts have swung back and forth on various issues related to free speech, the incitement to panic versus incitement to imminent lawlessness, stuff like that. Um, the Supreme Court's even singled out sex and poo as uniquely offensive. Don't believe me? These things are specific prongs of the Miller test, 
which is something that the courts use to determine whether or not something is obscene. The Miller test was developed way back in 1973 in the case Miller v. California. And according to the Miller test, the following three conditions must all be met for the courts to consider something obscene. Pay attention. Condition one, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to prurient interest. Uh, contemporary community standards, meaning local community standards, not a national or global one. Um, number two in the Miller test is whether the work depicts or describes a pat in a patently offensive way sexual conduct or excretory functions specifically defined by applicable state law. That's what I'm saying. Poo and sex are, are specifically obscene. Unless it involves excrement or sexual conduct, it can't be obscene, according to the U.S. Supreme Court. And number three is whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. That thing about intellectual worthiness that I was talking about before. So what that means, according to the definition that the Supreme Court of the U.S. uses, is something like racist sentiment that doesn't reference sex or bodily functions it's impossible for that to be officially obscene because in order for something to be officially obscene, according to the Supreme Court, it has to be patently offensive sexual conduct or excretory functions or the descriptions in thereof, which is really, really limiting. This this idea that somebody crapping on somebody else for mutual pleasure might be considered obscene, but the dehumanization of an entire people is not considered obscene because of this very narrow definition that the courts have set up. The Miller, def the Miller test also puts female artists at a unique disadvantage simply because women have more body parts that are considered potentially obscene than men and women's sexuality is still more socially restricted. That doesn't mean that people want to see male bodies more than female bodies. It means that there's more judgments on how women depict our own bodies, which is why any feminist, quite frankly, should be seriously concerned about any sort of obscenity law, in my opinion. Another example is with that community standards thing. Some people find the entire existence of trans people obscene. So any depiction of a trans person having sex could be cons could be seen to be obscene under the Miller test, especially since the Miller test is applied based on local sentiments, not national ones. And what that means is, well, trans bodies likely don't offend the average person in Manhattan. In Birmingham, Alabama, it's a different story. Now, in terms of... Um, conventionally distributed pornography. Pornography has been um, put to obscenity tests so many times that this might not be a worry. I'm not sure. Um, one one um, case was decided by the Miller test that because uh, so many people in local hotels use pay-per-view porn, um, another uh, showing of pornography was not seen as to violate community standards. Um, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like, this is a very, very checkerboard um, way to decide whether somebody's free speech should be limited based on obscenity. Uh, and many people believe that the idea of offensiveness is a poor paradigm to judge the appropriateness of speech to begin with. Um, a lot of huge leaps in social progress initially started off as statements seen as offensive. For instance, a woman's right to vote. That was, oh God, the entire Decla Declaration of Sentiments, Seneca, Seneca Falls Convention, that was the one where the Quakers went, whoa, hold up there, because even Quaker men didn't really vote. They didn't believe in a, uh, you know, secular authority over gods. Um, a woman's right to control her own health decisions was once considered obscene and controversial. Black people using the same water fountains as white people was considered dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, obscene. And gay people doing anything, but especially having the right to marry, was considered obscene at one point. They were offensive ideas. So... If we limit offensiveness, we may very well limit progress. But I want to make another point. If something is actually a human right, it shouldn't be a right in California, but not a right in Arkansas just because of local opinion. It's, it's a very strange 
limit, arbitrary limit the Supreme Court has set out in terms of the right to offend, in terms of obscenity. Um, the localization issue all, also makes defining free speech based on the U.S. First Amendment something of an odd choice. The U.S. is an outlier in the world regarding not only its allegedly complex morals, uh, common complex morals, but also regarding how its laws work. America is a presidential republic with a complex electoral college system. It's a unique system in the world, as opposed to something like parliamentary democracy, like what's practiced here in Canada and most other parts of the British Commonwealth. That sort of democratic system is more widely used around the world. Just as an example, and, and the way the U.S. Constitution works, the way the U.S. system works, really informs the way um, American laws are written in this sort of intense, uniquely bludgeoning language, as opposed to the way Canadian laws and other types of laws are written to be more flexible so they don't have to be re rewritten over and over and over again. It's based on sort of what is reasonable, what is determined to be reasonable, and they can evolve over time. But because of the way the U.S. Constitution works, why should the whole world be bound by the unique issues surrounding U.S. free speech and the U.S. Constitution and the way the U.S. handles rights? That's a fair question to ask. People are probably noping all over the place, but that's a fair question to ask. Perhaps it is legitimately the best standard, but maybe it's not. and We don't know unless we test it. Um, if you're interested, a more international standard um, for, regarding freedom of expression is um, Articles 18 through 22 of the UN's Declaration of Human Rights. Now, people, a lot of people go, nope, UN, nope, 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 nope. But just, just as a point of comparison, look at the difference of how it's, uh, of how it's, it's laid out and worded. Now, the print here is quite small. So I'll read it, but everything was quite small because it's a really long document. Okay, here we go. Article 18, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Article 20, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Part two, no one may be compelled to belong to an association. That's a really interesting one there. Article 21, Everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country directly or through freely chosen representatives. Everyone has the right of equal access to public service in his country. The will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures and article 22 everyone as a member of society has the right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international cooperation and is in uh, i can't read it anyway never mind i think i went one too far anyway let's go back i think i did uh no i didn't i didn't finish i'll finish uh uh, national effort, international cooperation in accordance with the organization of resources of each state of the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of personality. That's right. It was that social, cultural rights and dignity aspect. Let me go back to it because I kind of blew it there. Um, right at the bottom, Article 22. Um, economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. And those are little nuances that are not in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, including the right to vote. One of the things that's that's quirky about the U.S. system is that the right to vote is not considered um, freedom of expression. Why not? I, I don't know. It's one of the most critical expressions a citizen can have in a society. Now, these nuances, these things that because the, the First Amendment is, is so relatively short as opposed to the article, 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 article of the UN Declaration of Rights, um, 
because it's so short, um, there is a lot of subjectivity and this is really important in understanding the current fight over American style free speech. Some people claim that the dreaded alt right is co opting the free speech movement into, as McLean's magazine, and I use this because it's actually a conservative publication, it leans heavily conservative up here in Canada. But McLean's magazine called the so called freedom of speech advocacy of the alt right grievance mongering for profit. Now, others claim that America's sweeping free speech concepts, including the idea that money is speech, thanks Citizens United, give the powerful too much opportunity to silence the less wealthy or the less socially connected. This thinking has given rise to things like controversial and some say unnecessary hate speech laws in other countries, which are based on the idea that free speech has always been subjected to reasonable limits and that racist speech does more harm than good and should therefore be restricted. Racist speech is just one example. Um, in Canada, it's uh, any protected group, and those protected groups just recently were um, added transgender people and there was much shrieking and then everything got back to normal. Um, besides that, there's another interesting point of Canadian history in that regard. Um, the woman who would go on to become the first female chief justice of Canada's Supreme Court, a woman by the name of Beverly McLaughlin, dissented against the hate speech laws back in the 1980s in a case against James Keegan, who was an Alberta teacher, Keegstra, I'm sorry, James Keegstra, who was an Alberta teacher who was teaching his students that the Holocaust was a hoax. I'm not kidding. That happened out in Alberta. Um, while I suspect there's very few people who disagree that Keekstra should have been stripped of his teaching license, meaning most people go, yeah, that dude shouldn't be teaching because he's not teaching stuff based on facts. Um, a lot more people object to the idea that Keekstra's bigoted conspiracy theory should constitute a crime. And Beverly McLaughlin herself, again, woman who would go on after this to become Canada's first female Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, McLaughlin argued that criminalizing speech gave bigots a platform to spread their hateful ideas through public trials and that the benefits of hate speech laws didn't outweigh the risks of them. Her explanation was obviously more complex than this. It's very compelling. She also challenged Canadian laws as written, not the general idea of laws against hatred, but you get the idea of the amount of dissent that goes on in this country that you might not be um, uh, aware of if you just get your views of um, uh, Canadian law, uh, Canadian jurisprudence through the internet or, you know, American cable services. They, they really oversimplify the back and forth that goes on here. In fact, Beverly McLaughlin was subsequently vindicated when one of Canada's laws that used to be used against hate speech was ruled to be unconstitutional. It's really ironic because it was a law that prohibited reporting false news. We had an anti-fake news law in Canada. It was used against a Holocaust denial, among other people, a Holocaust denier by the name of Ernst Zundel. In 1988, it was struck down as being unconstitutional. They saw it as um, too, too much an infringement of freedom of speech. Um, so again, we've had really nuanced battles regarding free speech and hate speech in this country. And the 1980s here previewed many of the extreme stances that we have today in the fake news era, a seeming inability by many to distinguish between disagreeing with particular speech and thinking that it doesn't deserve to exist at all. Now, this seems to be the major fault in logic displayed by my critics. My belief, for the record, is that saying something is in poor taste, cruel, or based on faulty logic, that's not the same as denying someone's right to say something I believe is wrong. But there are a good number of people out there that continue to accuse me of being against free speech because I disagree with certain speech, and they tend to travel in packs on the internet. And that could be seen as a muzzling tactic and equal speech proponents continue to 
to get more and more vocal because they believe that's an issue with modern sp free speech norms. And this drives me crazy because I don't have a choice whether I'm, I'm sort of a pawn in this whole thing. Now, for the, bless you, Momo, Momo sneezing. Um, my personal thought against these people is it's really hard to take seriously someone who's accusing me of being anti-free expression when that person is the one who's been reduced to histrionics by something I said. That's kind of hypocritical because if you can't disagree with someone else's speech, then speech isn't really free, is it? And ironically, historically, that's been the disconnect with free speech, between free speech on paper and free speech in practice. The history of freedom ex of expression is sadly, based on what I've seen, a history of failed experiments. There's never been a society where speech was truly free for all people. Some group has always had their freedom of expression infringed by another group or worse, the government, like the voting disenfranchisement that's going on in uh, in the U.S. and various states right now. It's that history that I want to take a look at. Free speech, the good, the bad, and the ugly, starting with the ancient Greeks, moving into the Enlightenment, then into the modern age, with some comparison of free speech issues around the world. I wasn't going to do that last part. I was going to stick to sort of Western thought, but... Um, Based on the feedback some people gave, that's uh, something you're interested in. I'll do my best. I I am not as familiar with certain cultures and others, but I'm going to take a look. Um, I'm doing this because I believe that this debate involves a lot of well-meaning people who are defining free speech in profoundly different ways without real awareness that there are other legitimate understandings of this issue. I'm also doing this to try to guard against the inclination many people have that free speech should only be allowed for people who think like them. I also refuse to relinquish, relinquish my right to publicly disagree with other people because people want to try to weaponize the very concept of free speech. But I also don't want this to turn into a pissing match, so I think that a presentation of information is the way to approach this. This isn't going to be a super scheduled or formal thing because I'm doing this while juggling a lot of other stuff. But I think it's worthwhile to help everyone get, if not on the same page, then at least reading from the same book. So that's what I'm going to do going forward. This is a little bit of a start. Didn't get into much of the nitty gritty now, but I like to do an ov overview. I like to state sort of my intentions before I dive in because it means a lot less stuff gets misconstrued. Something always gets misconstrued, but that's the reality of communication. Um, the next video will probably be next week. Um, it's a bit busy, but I'll try to get something out. Like I said, I'm going to start with the ancient Greeks and the two competing concepts of what are loosely translated into freedom of speech, but there's some nuance there. Isagoria and uh, Parhesia. I'm I always blow that second one, but uh, it's something I'm super interested in. I think you will be too. It's really cool how we're still sort of struggling with, with the contradiction between those two things even today, but I want to sort of lay a groundwork um, about the various things and sort of the history of the various things and, and how it's sort of replicated in other older cultures in different ways. Some, not all, but um Thanks for watching. I appreciate you sticking through this. And I, I think it's all something that even if we don't come at it from the same hardcore perspective, it's all something we agree is important. So hopefully we can go forward based on that common understanding and sort of common support for it. And hey, if this thing takes off, I'm willing to do like dialogues, like back and forth, like dialogue option style conversations with people on the subject. Who knows? I'm just dipping my toe in. I'm starting to get, you know, my research uh, exercise again. Um, so thanks for watching.